So again, welcome everybody to the second session of Sliver. Uh, my name is Maya Ozalic. I'm extremely happy to host this party tonight. Uh, it's also so nice to see so many familiar faces. Uh, so I hope it's going to be a, a really nice evening we're going to spend together. So today's panel gathers graduates under the title Academic and Research Networks to discuss the reciprocity between educating, researching, and building, if we can just call it that way. So in a way, I think we're talking in the context of an expanded practice, as our panel guests uh, will demonstrate, and I think that maybe the notion is also worth to address later on. But we also want to address the importance of research within the contemporary architectural academia, practice, and broader design and building culture. So since the enlight uh, Enlightenment the prolifer and the proliferation of disciplines, science and art used to be developed independently from each other in terms of examination and interpretation of knowledge. And the knowledge both accumulated was for long not considered equally relevant. But this preconception about the strict separation of disciplines and value of the gained knowledge have been challenged already by the 20th century avant-garde. Georgi Kepesh, uh, the founder of the Center of Advanced Vis Visual Studies at the MIT, passionately emphasized the link between experimentation and experience, which for him creates a common ground for artistic and scientific research. Since the 1990s, the <coughs> potential nature and scope of, of practice-led and practice-based research in the arts and design has been debated. And although it, it may have, uh, it may have a, a bit of a slow start, labs within the architectural academia have been thriving, and a big number of schools consider them as an integral part of their educational mission, or adopt cross-disciplinary research strategies as a pedagogical exercise. So to take up uh, one of Noam Chomsky's uh, paraphrases, which describes the spirit, it's not important what we cover in class, it's important what you discover. Also at the Institute of Architecture, the body of professional researchers and founded research project has been expanding. Uh, but Patrick Schumacher already, already described the work at the master class with the following enthusiasm. The Angewandte, is one of those rare schools where teaching gives rise to original design research in form of a systematic, theory-led explo exploration of new architectural possibilities. In this sense, at the Angewand, the exploration as a product of collective effort of all involved parties, educators and students alike contribute to it in order to establish itself in the very essence of architectural thinking. So tonight's panelists represent a strong network of various architectural agendas distributed across continents and significantly contribute to a greater architectural discourse. Therefore, I'm very happy to open up a conversation between old friends and new friends. And I will very, very briefly introduce them, also in order to how uh, their presentations were follow. So let's start with Matthias Del Campo who graduated at the Angewandte in January 2003 from the master class of Hans Holle. Together with Sandra Maninga, that founded the architectural office of <coughs> static architecture with offices in Shanghai and Ann Arbor in the US. SPAN is practicing across various fields of architecture from building and designing, exhibiting and curating, writing and publishing, educating and researching. Matthias himself, taught at the University of Pennsylvania, the RMIT in Melbourne, Australia, the RPI Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Deso Institute of Architecture at the Bauhaus, and held workshops uh, and lectures in China, Mexico, Japan, Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, and all over the US. And today, he is the Associate Professor of Architecture at Bautmann College in Michigan. The next one would be Moritz Dostermann, who graduated uh, at the Angewandte in 2011 uh, from the masterclass of Zaha Hadid and Patrick Schumacher. 
Since then, Moritz uh, is a research associate and doc uh, doctoral candidate at the Institute of uh, Computational Design and Construction in, uh, at Stuttgart University. Moritz is a guest lecturer, uh, lecturer and uh, chair of emerging technologies at the Technical University of Munich. And he lectures and teaches at various, and, uh, various institutions, including the GSD Harvard. He is also the managing partner of the company called Fiber, a specialist com uh, company for computational design and robotic fabrication of bespoke filament structures. So Maury's projects are internationally published and, exhi and exhibited, and uh, his research achieves a simultaneous advancement of building culture and technology. And Daniel Köhler, also graduated at the Angewandte in 2008 from the studio, uh, from the master class of Simon Kavit and Patrick Sch uh, Schumacher. He holds a PhD <coughs> in urban design from the University of Innsbruck. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he is an architect, urbanist, researcher, and teacher based in London. He leads the research cluster and urban design at the UCL Bartlett School of Architecture. He is a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Innsbruck and the co-founder of the Lab for Environmental Design Strategies. He has taught at several institutions, including the Sayar, Städelschule, Alte University, the Nurse Academy of Arts, and the University of East London. And he's also the co-founder of Lab Ants, uh, an office he founded together with Raza Navasai Thier. That was a little bit wrong, but I apologize. Uh, follows uh, Christoph Kumpusch, who graduated in the master class of Wolf Briggs in 2006. He received his PhD at the Angewandte in 2012 and is practicing in, in New York. In 2008, he founded a multidisciplinary practice called Forward Slash, which is both a design and a publishing outfit, producing essays, books, exhibitions, installations, podcasts, performances, films, and buildings. He has previously taught at the Cornell University's uh, AAP, Ohio State University, Pratt Institute School of Architecture and the Department of Humanities and Media Studies, uh, and the SIAC. Currently, he is the adjunct pro uh, associate professor and co one coordinator of the graduate program at GSEP uh, at Columbia University in New York City, where he also recently founded the Extraction Lab, a laboratory primarily focusing on researching situations rather than objects. And warning, the laboratory will self-destruct on August 1st, 2021. And the last but not least, Nicole Stöckemeyer, who graduated in 2006 from the master class of Zana Hadid and Patrick Schumacher, she holds a PhD in Cultural Studies from the Uni University of Applied Arts Vienna. She was a research associate at Max Institute for Advanced Study on Media Cultures of Computer Simulation, uh, as well as lecturer at Rufania University Lüneburg, research fellow at the IKKM, International College for Cultural uh, Studies and <coughs> Media Philosophy, and lecturer at Bauhaus University in Weimar. Through her work, she examines the techniques of the contemporary architectural practice and their impact on design culture, with a particular emphasis on digital visualization, computation, and robotics in architecture. So please give them a warm welcome, and I can invite Matthias to keep up. Thanks so much for this super kind introduction. Uh, I don't know if you really started, but it was nice hearing it. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. It's always an ordeal to actually speak at your, at your alma mater, so because it's basically the institution that you owe most of your decisions to do throughout your career. So it's great to be back uh, and talk a little bit more about basically make some ideas on academics and research especially in research, and what I have to do with, with it. So 
Of course, I mean, there's still the one side, the idea of how does the practice form ideas that you want to continue in, in the studio. There is a very close bond relationship in, in, in our case, to some myself, about how the practice actually informs um, design desires, ideas, fascinations, obsessions, if you like. Uh, and very often in the States, actually, we come back and say, okay, one thing that most influenced me as a designer is certainly Vienna. And, and it took me a long, long time to admit that. Yeah? Uh, but actually, the fact that we, we pass by those things on a daily basis, uh, I think most definitely create an imprint in your mind about what actually architecture could be, not only as, a, as something that you admire from the past, but something that can become a future. And I'm just going to quickly go through some of uh, the projects. I'm not going to go into detail, but at least that we get a taste of what these are the kinds of things that we're interested in, the kind of formations we're interested in, the way how we reference history and apply it to design, the ways how we, we play around with mathematics and geometries to, to constitute a, a specific uh, disciplinary problems in architecture, trying to understand and, and work through them uh, through the tool sets that we certainly started to learn in the school, but tried to expand as soon as we actually came out of the school again. I have to say that uh, it is, of course, an, 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 uh, the, the idea that you can need to generate a specific rigor in your work and a specific directory, direction that you want to go in your work is, of course, something that uh, falls back also in the studio work, in the things that you do in, in any sort of workshop, even if it's just a small workshop or a whole year. So, for example, currently Sandra and I are both teaching a thesis studio at, uh, at Michigan, which actually takes a year. I think that's actually a fantastic uh, opportunity, which is not that often. I think still here like that, right? So I think that's actually something that has a lot of value in terms of how to continue or develop your first rigorous project in an architectural environment. So this is an exhibition that we did this year. And you also see the, the way how sometimes the work actually becomes more and more abstract the more we come to the, uh, to the current uh, state. This is because we're actually fascinated with the idea of generating something like an abstract machine that informs then a series of projects throughout several years. But then we go into the, into the academia. So every endeavor in academia starts with the first person who gives you one job to teach. And in my case, it was actually Gerhard Zettel. So I would like to remember him as my first mentor in terms of education. It was really fantastic of him to just say, like, we were like, we would like to do a workshop. Sure, come. Yeah. It was amazing. So he gave Sandra and myself the opportunity to teach at the postgraduate, which was really our beginning, our first steps, like getting a taste of what academia could be. Completely naive and you know very bad, I think, in, in retrospect, but it was a thing, a necessary step you have to take. And then we get we got another really generous supporter and mentor, which was Alfred Jacobi at the Deso Institute of Architecture in uh, right next to the Bauhaus who was uh, so kind to more or less let us do whatever we want to do. And which also, again, is something that you have to cope with. You have to really start developing your own agencies and again, the sense on. And then move further to Penn to teach there. Around the time, actually pretty much exactly before Reynolds had to let us do the first workshop, we actually went to Los Angeles on the, on the Max Scholarship. And that was a super crucial moment for us because I think we learned so much about teaching in LA. Just going to reviews, being invited to seminars, just seeing what they're doing, how they're preparing their outlines, how to actually create, create like a rigorous approach to a studio. So all these sort of things, which I have to admit, I didn't see them here that much. They were so present in Los Angeles, and, and it was really like an, an, a fascinating moment for me. <coughs> so after that, both uh, and I went to Penn, uh, uh, where we worked as uh, lecturers for a couple of years. And certainly, suddenly certain things happened in parallel. So we were on the one side of the pen, on the other side we went to Tongji to uh, do so almost like yeah, on a yearly basis, uh, do a workshop there, uh, which is called Digital Futures. Then we started working with RMIT in Australia, where Sandra and I currently are, for example, alternating studios. Like one year I do a studio, one year she does a studio. But I think my, or I would say my, my main home base right now is, uh, of course, uh, I can't say how lucky I am to be coming into Tottenham College at this moment. But it's great. Yeah, it's I'd like for Michigan to be something that as many people as possible feel part of. <laughs> All right. So you heard right now Jonathan Macy, our new dean, and how happy he is to be at Taupin, which is, of course, amazing. So the, uh, we just opened uh, our new building, uh, literally like a couple of weeks ago. 
Uh, and he literally also came to his first day at work when we opened the building. So it was really like a perfect combination and a collision of uh, events. Uh, it's a beautiful building designed by the person called Cohn, um, and which has expanded actually our, our universe quite a lot. Um, and the possibilities we have at the school, we were already a little cramped, but now I think we really can breathe again. Um, just to give you a little bit more of an insight of what we do, uh, there is of course this whole fame, that fame, I don't know if it's fame, but, but the, the topic that we're certainly focusing a lot on computational design and fabrication. And we have this, uh, this opportunity that students can really hands-on learn on the one side the, the discourse, the theory, the possibilities of computational design, but at the same time immediately a materialization process, like how to build this, how to do it, and, and also in a specific scale. Uh, Michigan being basically the heartland of industry in the States, you, you can notice that in the school there is this big tradition of making and doing and constructing. Yeah? And um, so we have several programs that are focusing specifically on this uh, in these areas and produce also, I think, an, an incredible output over the year. Of course, one part is having these machineries, one part is having all this, this, uh, this um, to, sorry, let me go back here one more time. Um, Of course, on the one side we have uh, the machinery and the possibilities to work with this. On the other side, uh, a crucial part of the whole thing is the conversation, the discussion, the theory, the, the, the developing of a, of, a, of, a, of a disciplinary problem that you work on in the studios. And I think exactly this combination, this collision yeah, between intellectual problem and, and problem of materialization is, I think, a pretty unique position to be in. So we're not only theorizing the things, we're actually trying to, let's say, set up like an, like, an, like an experimental proof of the idea. And this is not only done by students. Uh, by the way, this is our, our studio space, or part of it. Just to describe it to you, the whole studio space is about 100 meters, by 100, sorry, about 1,000 square meters, open space. There is actually no divisions in between, there's no walls. It's just these rows and rows and rows of tables. And every student has like about this much space, which is not really that luxurious, but uh, it, it actually kind of, uh, we have this counterbalance on the one side, each table might be small, but you have all these facilities around it which are rather large and where you can really start constructing larger scale things. So the, the school does not only focus on, um, on, the, on the, let's say, creation of academic work by students, there's also the opportunity for faculty to develop their own work further. There's something called the Research to Making program, where actually faculty members can apply for a fund to develop a large scale installation over one year. And this is specifically to be done with students. So there's like a very close collaboration between teachers, professors, and students. Also, what I, what I personally think is, is quite fascinating for, to me is how much you as professor has to be totally hands on with that. Yeah, you have to be really be there. You, you also have to be able to work with the machines. You have to know about the code you're using. So you, you really, it's not like a, it's not just a couple of people that are just uh, guiding the, the whole idea and then the, some assistants work for on that. It's really you have to do it. Yeah? So there's no way around it. And I think that's quite challenging sometimes. Yeah, but it's also very rewarding. Quickly, as a more cl a close up into an academic collaboration, uh, we were um, a couple of years ago. Son and I got this prize to, to go to CERN for as a fellowship, basically. And based on this fellowship, we actually created a, a relationship with Lucerne for the school. And we have now, uh, the thesis projects are all focusing currently on designing a new campus for Lucerne. Let's briefly put it. Of course, there's much more behind it. But it's, a, it's quite a fascinating idea that students are able to collaborate on a project that is a real life project. It's not completely speculative. Yeah? Although I love speculative projects, but this is really a, a project that will see the day of light in 20 years' time. It's a gigantic project, and I think it's a scale and dimension and importance where students very rarely have the chance to, to be part of. And, and I really like sharing that possibility for, uh, for the students. Um, <coughs> just very quickly about uh, some of the agencies that are basically in research right now in our own studios. It's basically ideas about post-human conditions, finding other design agencies other than human ones. Uh, discussing the post-digital, for example. So what happens after 20 plus years of computational design? Do we still need to call it digital design or digital architecture, or is this basically a, a title uh, that doesn't have any value anymore, right? 
So we really need to, to reconsider basically how we're operating along, along these lines, and I think that's one of the trajectories of the design agencies in our case. We are, the, the good news is that this, all these kind of tool sets are really spreading all over the world. So the workshop you saw before was done at RMIT. This one here is done at TomGym. So you see like the tool sets are really almost everywhere the same. So you can actually plug into different places in the world and continue one specific research uh, done, on, done with, with, in different studios and in different, um, in different uh, uh, countries. By the way, this is a video I really like to show to people who ask me what's going to happen with the jobs in the future. Check out how many people are actually dancing around with to make it work. Yeah? So I don't think it's going to be less jobs, it looks like it's going to be more jobs. Um, okay. Anything else coming up? Oh yeah. Uh, reviews, of course, I mean, you know all about review spaces, we know all about this kind of review culture, which I think is super important. And uh, I'm happy that we, can, that we have this sort of culture also present in Michigan. That's a very American thing in some way, I think. But it's fantastic, and um, we really try to push that forward, forward more. And but in order to be able to, at the end, also generate spaces that have these sort of qualities. So the relationship between uh, the academic networks, and these are just you know a, a not complete list of reviews I've been in the last two years or so. Uh, in order just to show that the, the networking, the, the network aspect in academia is highly important in the way how you ex exchange yourself. Also, for example, I've been. Working for working for Basel is the wrong term. I was serving uh, as, as external examiner for a couple of years, or creating things <coughs> like uh, hosting Acadia conference. So we actually hosted Acadia 2016, which was definitely geared towards ideas of the post-human condition and how they are applied in computation design these days. Uh, and publication and publishing, of course, part of academia, and I think it should be also like that. Um, not only with the Arcadia um, catalog, but for example, last year I published one edition of AD, or I, I, I was the editor of one edition of AD, which was specifically geared towards going away from the, com the conversation in computational design about the tool set and explaining how we did it, but rather to explain what does it do, what's the, what's the cultural implications that our work actually entail. And to, to summarize, I'm a Venice architect. Uh, teaching in an art in the United States and being published by Tongji in, in China. So this is basically, how, in, in a nutshell, basically what I do. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. So, thank you for the invitation. Good to be back here. And I actually stuck to something that we were requested to do, which is put up the image at the very first slide about a project you did here at the university. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, um, that was, that's actually not my diploma project, it's the predecessor of the project, so it's the original. But what is interesting here is that um, at that time I was uh, already looking at uh, material performances and uh, this was a more adaptive organism evolving over time. Uh, and already had a certain interrelation between um, design outcome and uh, uh, performance uh, material characteristics and how that would work as a structure uh, as well. And I think that's something that I also um, took further during my um, uh, late, later work, uh, where um, we do a lot of technological work, like developing, building technologies that enable uh, lighter or more functionally integrated structures. But I think at the same time, uh, and that's something that, that Matthias just mentioned, it's really important to see uh, what can we actually do with it and um, what is the enlarged design space that we can navigate by developing uh, uh, those tools, uh, methods, and materials uh, uh, we use. So um, I have like three different heads. So it's like <laughs> most of what I'm showing is uh, the past six years of research at the University of Stuttgart. Uh, Institute for Computation Design uh, and Construction. Uh, currently, um, I'm teaching at the TU Munich, uh, and I just started my own company uh, for robotic fabrication uh, of those filament uh, structures. Um, so the relations between uh, research, academia, teaching, and then uh, actually bring it into practice uh, uh, is quite quite crucial. And like, there's a lot of re reciprocal uh, uh, information. So there's just questions coming from, uh, from practice. Uh, it's, it's a huge challenge to save resources uh, in construction <coughs> nowadays, but if we do that in a merely technical way, uh, we end up with 
just technical installation and a different technical installation. So it's really important to have a basic research funding where you can actually start developing things from the bottom up, seeing what would be a really meaningful way to use less resources and utilize that as a design driver as well. So that it actually also uh, the, the change in building technology also leads to a change in uh, in the design that we can uh, produce. So. Um, I was doing a bit of basic research uh, in Stuttgart, uh, working a lot inter interdisciplinary with um, biologists, um, uh, paleontologists, uh, evolution specialists. And then uh, I think what is important and interesting in the context of um, like the topic that we're doing here is uh, how research and teaching are really, really interlocked and working together and not possible one without the other in this middle phase where we had uh, a really strong correlation between uh, what we were pushing in our studio and the demonstrators we were building and the research project running uh, at the institute. And now also uh, transferring and actually in a very short time for such a novel technology uh, influencing what can be actually do in practice. So a very short, uh, I'm not going into the biomedic bi part of this uh, too deeply, but just why are we working with filament structures. Um, so in nature, most uh, load-bearing structures are made from uh, fiber composites. So you have uh, chitin, uh, cellulose, um, uh, or collagen uh, fibers um, that build the load-bearing structures. And that's one example where the geometry is not a design feature, uh, but it's really emerging through um, uh, the interrelations, negotiating a set of boundary conditions in terms of function and material efficiency. On the other hand, it still creates very interesting geometries that could be interesting architecturally as well, in a technical sense and in a design sense as well. So composites um, have the interesting uh, quality that the material organization defines the performance of the material. So we don't have an isotropic material like a piece of steel, but we can really uh, place individual fibers and achieve really different uh, properties and appearances. And that's something that would be really beneficial if that could be transferred into architectural design as well. On the, other, on the other hand, it's not only material efficiency that's interesting, as well as functional integration. So uh, such a lobster shell, for example, is also negotiating interior and exterior climate, uh, which is also a huge topic in architecture. So we transfer that by using um, technical composites. So that's basically not a novel material. It has been around in um, aerospace uh, for quite a while, and also has been tested in architecture uh, since, uh, since a while. But um, could never be really used uh, to full potential, mainly due to the underlying processes, how it's designed, how it's uh, actually uh, uh, manufactured. And um, you still see that nowadays, for example, huge wind uh, blades are, are molded from composites. Um, although they would be very interested in having each one locally adapted to where the windmill is standing actually, they still produce the same because that mold costs a huge amount of money, so they basically just use the fiber as a passive receptor of form. And we wanted to give the material more stay in the, in the forming uh, process and also utilize its capacity uh, for lighter structure much more. So um, we do that nowadays by revisiting these materials uh, uh, with a novel tool set. Uh, computation design, simulation, fabrication, integrated uh, uh, in, a, in a design process uh, where fabrication is not a subsequent step but actually a design driver uh, in the beginning. And um, that started with the first project uh, we did in Stuttgart and that's where we're back to the research teaching interrelation. So those projects are only possible because we have a really dedicated group of students who are uh, pushing it, working on it, taking responsibility for also for important research parts of the project and a good network. Uh, of other institutes uh, and industry partners supporting this. So what we did is uh, use the robot and wind the fibers on a very reduced scaffold. And the interesting part here is that the fibers now, the curvature is really emerging through the process. So the sequence in which the robot applies the fibers uh, lets them reciprocally deform them and introduces interesting curvatures into the geometries which uh, are uh, exploring the novel repertoire, but on the other hand are also structurally very meaningful. Important project and uh, part of those projects is that we actually um, have uh, the luxury situation that we can actually scale that up to a certain degree. So an architectural demonstrator, a research demonstrator is never like a full building, but you're pushing one research aspect uh, while uh, leaving a lot of other as aspects that you need to consider subsequently from architecture uh, behind. But it's uh, really important uh, to show uh, that this is also a design exploration and that the material materiality is really like um, um, self-expressed to a certain, <coughs> certain degree. Um, for example, here in a tectonic way, so this one was a monocoque shell made in one piece. Here we had a pre prefabricated segmented shell, uh, which allowed prefabrication, either handling on site, transportation, but also was then architectural, uh, 
uh, architecturally expressed and uh, visual, and also allows for a very high degree of local details emerging through the processes that we're using. And that's again one, one just I uh, put for one project now the list of students there, which is already a while ago, but just to, to show that there's a really a handful of researchers, but most of it are really the students. And it's not that the students are a workforce, but the students are really giving crucial research input uh, into these projects. And we have um, industrial partners who are really interested in pursuing this kind of research and uh, also exploring a novel market for them, for the materials, for the machines, for the processes. Um, we developed the computational tools for that as well. One, uh, the geometry is uh, emerging by negotiating the boundary conditions, so uh, digital morphogenesis, and then uh, we have another tool which is then lo lo looking much more locally how should the fibers be aligned in this kind of structure. Um, interesting thing again, like the formwork is only that line on the top and the rest of the curvature is really emerging through the process and the fibers. Uh, uh, interacting, which is then uh, very visible in the final uh, outcome. Uh, to highlight this interrelation between the tools and the outcome a little bit, I have one project uh, which is not shown so often, which is a smaller um, uh, surface, but uh, we were working with uh, aerospace engineers who have interesting stitch, stitch, stitching methods for um, calm fiber, and that again is a different technology and has also then a different uh, uh, articulation, more like a closed uh, surface with a few lines. Um, here in another project we were using a very um, different uh, design approach where before we were already developing this meta design tool where you as a designer still have some top-down capacity to influence the design but a lot, a lot of the geometry is negotiating uh, between the boundary conditions and here we went a little bit further and had the robot really as a fabrication agent so um, uh, while the robot was one, running there were life decisions where to place the next fiber based on a lot of information that was uh, uh, streamed uh, to the machine uh, and uh, that allows a lot of interesting structural articulations uh, uh, to emerge during the fabrication process itself. And uh, it was an interesting process where we had a pneumatically supported shell that was then reinforced from the inside and later the entrance was cut open. Um, and again, that was very challenging to develop on the technical side, but uh, when you see the light effects coming in, how uh, the material is articulated, uh, how thin that shell is, uh, I think that's really uh, interesting to explore in an uh, uh, architectural way as well. So we, at this point, already were interested in how could that now transfer into practice, so there's a lot of uh, uh, beneficial um, uh, yeah, work between research and teaching, but also how can this be applied. So we had smaller side projects where, for example, we built a fast stand for the University of Stuttgart, where the lightness of the modules, the modularity, transportability, uh, but also the, um, the expression of the material are things that uh, are quite interesting uh, to be used in, in fast end uh, design. And that's something that we're also currently uh, pursuing uh, in, in, in the company. So one larger project uh, was at the Victorian Albert Museum uh, in London and allowed us actually to work a little bit on the scalability, on construction details, but also on the functional integration. So the short intro about our research field here is a little bit too short to go into the centers that are integrated here, but this was really a functional integration project where we had uh, structural centers, centers that sense how people utilize the space, and environmental centers embedded that would then inform an online machine, the robot, um, the on-site machine, fabrication uh, machine, to build the next component to expand this, which is, which is again a really different uh, mode to conceive a structure uh, in green public uh, space. Uh, while maintaining all those interesting uh, shadows being cast, um, the glass fibers versus the carbon fiber, how they create this light and glossy effects. So it makes structure a lot of sense to use glass fiber and carbon fiber in different parts of the structure. But it's again a very readable, interesting articulation with the contrast. And you can see this certain reinforcements. And at night, it's just great for shows and events to have those fibers uh, uh, lit up. That's something that we'll use for an installation that's coming up in Frankfurt. Uh, as well. Integrated building details, yeah, how, how is the skin attached to this, how does it interface with the, um, with the steel construction, those are all important considerations. If you go from this very pure articulation of a fiber structure in an academic project and slowly want to uh, generate um, the interfaces with other building, building systems to be implemented in a larger uh, system, larger construction. <coughs> so this was exhibited at the Vita campus uh, as well, next to the Fuller Dome, which was uh, quite nice in the context of uh, uh, robotic exhibition at the uh, Vitra Design Museum, which also was over here at the uh, MAC, uh, I think. Um, and uh, I think the interesting part is how we are really in this early ex um, exploration phase. 
uh, how uh, do we find a specific repertoire when we develop structures from this material from bottom up. I like to um, compare it often with cast iron structures where uh, a lot of interesting developments were made from mimicking some wood constructions and then uh, in Victorian greenhouses there were with this very interesting filigree degree structures, which in the end then were constrained and standardized to steel beams, but I think with the technology we have nowadays, we can, we can keep something of that uh, design opportunities while exploring uh, the materiality. So based on all these projects that we did over the last years, um, we received a lot of feedback and people were requesting actually projects uh, to be co-developed uh, with them, and based on that, uh, we just founded our own uh, company in Stuttgart which is basically um, exploring uh, how those technology can be employed in design of products, uh, interiors, uh, uh, larger structures, and uh, for a good reason uh, of certain benefits that the material brings with it, technologically and design-wise, and uh, that could be uh, structures, uh, facades, uh, or products, for example. Uh, a small thing that I'm showing, because we also talk about Patrick, so we have a small project together with um, Zaha where we did a, did a chair. And uh, at TU Munich, um, I taught two studios. So one was really focusing also request, based on the request of a, of a client who actually saw an application potential for that for covering large, huge areas with a very lightweight uh, system. And the other one is now um, working together with professorship for green technology and for um, uh, climate responsive design, where at the Luminale in Frankfurt, which is usually more a lightning show, uh, we will integrate these uh, urban features for air filtering uh, uh, into a structure that will be set up there. Uh, thank you. That's what I did after uh, after studying here, and I think there has been a lot of uh, a correlation between research, teaching, and um, it's interesting to see how those different uh, research ecologies evolve at different schools. I think that's um, uh, that's clearly also the case in, in Stuttgart. You just have a master program which works quite well. Also, after a while, it gets a certain rep uh, reputation. It attracts specifically people interested in that as well. And um, I think that's similar here uh, at the Angewandte. What I, what I still like and what I still, still like to implement in my studios when I teach is, is this studio atmosphere, this very intense working, every, everyone putting their heads together. I think that's something that uh, was really successful here and is still relevant in teaching. Thank you for the warm uh, invitation, and it's really beautiful to be back home. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of a different structure for my, my, my statement talk, like you know, you asked that 10 minutes, just to throw out like a, for, uh, a few hypotheses, what can be actually architecture and teaching and research. And I think it's time that we actually start uh, not anymore to talk about research by practice, research by theory or whatever, but to be also like, consider what does it mean research by architecture. So when, when I was studying here, so one thing what I learned that architecture really matters. So when, when one thing was really important in Studio HD, that holy, 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 uh, that it was really, really serious. That it was really like so intensive or so energetic that the work, what, what we did really were relevant. But this was the core, I think, the core message, what, what I learned uh, during my studies. So, and this was also a little bit, no, my, my diploma project. <laughs> <laughs> where, where I start actually, also, actually my diploma project to see more as raising a question. So what does it actually mean when you take now just architecture and actually try actually with this relevance of architecture or say, hey, how I can actually produce meaning through the, through the arrangement of architecture. So like how it can actually produce knowledge. So does it mean, is it, is it uh, technological knowledge or is it like uh, some grant relationship, is it economical knowledge and, and so on. So it continued that uh, it started to get important that you begin to describe buildings just simply through an arrangement of, of parts, of, of elements of architecture. 
Right? So then more typology, but uh, it's later I came like on <coughs> and called it um, neurology. Well, it's actually, so this whole like a diploma project, more like a starting of a research. Oh God, this is Maya. So one frame, five hours. Right? <laughs> 10 years ago, so it's like incrementing uh, uh, computation. So, like, uh, so what with this diploma project actually started is our research, which actually I'm still conducting at the moment, like with uh, students uh, from uh, from the uh, UCL Bartlett. So that's uh, a project from last year's uh, research. It's it's called the, the House of Walls. So here, like, uh, it's uh, what you see is like a, a, I think quite timely question uh, when we when we come to a, like a new way of machine age. So what if you just design or just actually want to <coughs> design a building and so on, and even in a, in a scale of a, of a settlement? So of course, with this, like, just questions raised, how actually a wall would actually produce meaning? Is it like something, even like, it gets quite difficult, how something easy as an enclosure is defined, or something as like a sequence of, of spaces? So also not like uh, occupational patterns, or like how you actually would talk about access. <coughs> of course, this is super crumpy, no? because uh, that's, that's complete by machine made, not really readable by, by, by humans. And by this also like the, the, the task or the challenge of being an architect, like it's far more, more distance. No? Far more, you're getting far more away like from, from actually, I think that, that uh, how you design actually, how you work, will in the next year's dramatically change because it's much more about sorting and searching right? and comparing and so on. Something also, no? because I'm coming from the bottom, but uh, recently Mario Capo as the professor of history that like, raises as a challenge for the next generation. So right? but this then also comes really like a crucial task, how I actually begin to see architectural figures and positioning them in an environment or relational context. So you can also do this versa. This is a work from uh, which I do with students in, in Innsbruck. Actually taking existing buildings here, like settlements of the structural phase. So like beginning with Ray Corbusier, ending with Ray Patrick, that uh, you then uh, uh, actually did searching for those moments when actually architectural positions to a city. Super, super traditional, not right? like what Alberti did when he talked about the city or like not more like articulating city. He could just stitch another part into onto a building. Huh? Michelangelo, so when he should design a plaza, what he does is taking arcade places and stitching them in front of the building. So now you can say, okay, like this research for architecture is super, super nice, it's, it's traditional and so on, but we are actually in a different phase. We're talking about communication architecture. Right? So here, uh, Christopher Alexander. Uh, uh, saying like, hey, uh, actually, uh, a form or architecture is a set of forces. Right? So you, you take, you take like, you collect uh, uh, whatever kind of flows and so on, and you combine it, and you get like a really decent uh, kind of uh, architecture object. So the most concurrent example for me is this one, because it's a one-to-one -one translation of the flow of financial market actually to a whole productive machine. Not it's just uh, an empty city I mean, somewhere in China, but it works completely beautiful uh, because it's like here, like uh, it's it's made for actually for financial market, no? for the set. It's a, it's a produced by a set of forces, and and here actually it's uh, it's very beautiful because it don't has to be even uh, uh, occupied by by real people. It's just about that you, you you sell these flats, you resell, and you increase the value. So it works beautiful this whole concept. In and now because we are at the younger mentor, of course, like like some some, some great architect like Hans Holland, like knew that it's actually exactly about the opposite. It's like not searching for a complete description, but architecture is actually directly from the beginning on bold and incomplete, and maybe like naive and maybe like a little disturbing, but for sure like a statement and something discreet, very disturbing discreet in the first place. Now you can also argue now, like hey, like all your part <coughs> argument, now all this research for architecture, now we don't need it because actually we have all these fantastic new technologies which will unfold in like new styles, new forms of architecture and so on. You see already that this might be a little bit polemic also from my side, 
But okay, let's do it more serious, like more in a deja vu of modernism. So um, uh, here no, you see uh, Walter Gropius, like coming up with the Bauhaus as an uh, explanation, a new style based on the assembly line. No, and this you can scale up to like really like to the, to the settlement, to the city, and so on and so forth. So this was CM2. So then on CM3, like the protagonist from the image before, and Smile even not participating in the, in the largest architecture conference so far conducted in, uh, in, in, in humankind history, you know, so like because it's really the largest architecture. So, um, here, like, uh, uh, Ansmeyer's collaborates, but uh, actually present a paper, so that's the only actually diagram in this paper, the rest is just like tabellas, which actually, uh, this paper says that, now, yeah, like, these all uh, productive forces is quite nice, but actually, you don't need prefabrication, other forms of production are actually getting much cheaper, but what was even more important is just actually the relevance of positioning these objects like how you divide ground, how you do this and that and that, so that actually the articulation of interest rates actually is the moment where actually architecture unfolds. Same conference, not by accident, Le Corbusier presents the Ville d'Artieus. And a few years later, also, the Corbus maybe sees that the real relevance is not the style in architecture. So now you can say this research by architect, okay, you want actually now like to take architecture and to measure it. Not something like modernism, not like and you know now from grasshopper, you take into account like you know, some light, blah blah blah. No 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 no. Uh, this modernists did not do. So actually like when you when you begin to research with architecture, of course you have a composition problem. So of course light is really like a prism. It's really like an, an object inside another object. So that's something, of course, today you would, would maybe like draw it like so. And of course, modern state did not come really further. Like then you have this, uh, you have the statement over like the composition of the light, and now you like you, know, you constrain the whole building towards and end up in this slabs and all this repetition. But what if you exactly take this, like taking architecture, and do actually researching on how does really like light influences uh, like really the form of a building. So what he said, same like it's not a slab, but it's just simply an arrangement of 3,000 groups according like uh, uh, considering their connectivity and so on, how you can minimum cost and minimum, but then actually unfolding a kind of building which is just oriented actually to this light. Right? So of course it's not thought that you actually you, you, you build actually this one on space, but more you build a settlement and actually, you, you, with this research on architecture, of course, you get again that research research where you get architecture back in a small scale. So that's so such connectivities. It's like abstract models that we know since 60s, 70s, like here, connectivities between cells. <coughs> not like you, you, you change the connectivity, for example, and you get certain pores of T's and, and so on. Not very, very nice. So, but what actually happens when we do it with, with architecture? No? It's like, just exchanging, so then of course these complexities and because of today's performance, not horizontal, vertical, 3D, we can we can do it like of course much more much more complex. That's of course that's not thought as a building. No? Like watch out, it's like begin to to think actually topics or complexities with architectural elements. No? So what's also nice, of course, there's nothing overlapping. So surprising because you put something before, like here you can cross you know, from left to right and so on. So actually, this kind of sponge thing is even usable even with a nice structure. You can also do it with subtraction, you know, taking more on a slab, just taking the weak arm and like a little bit subtracting it, and you get actually for the repetition of one element, <coughs> you know, just over like subtraction architecture, you get actually everything in difference. Uh, so like that's made just as a as an abstraction and I don't like really so these are models that <coughs> I'm working since with students mostly and also in terms of like uh, PhD so on and not the other publications was more in a in a research teaching environment there is of course these models are more thought like here that you think with architecture about like on this way of assembly, this way of composition, like maybe like also relevant topics. <coughs> maybe it's also something more talking about politics, talking about computational science at all. I mean, 
Do you not know, wonder that in computer science you talk just about stacks? And the first thing what you learn in architecture school that the stack is really, really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so like why we cannot actually begin to think with architecture and like unfold it actually to completely different disciplines, no? And interlock it like it's something which might be flat. Oops, this was too fast. And then actually reversing it, no? So when this was beginning 20th century, you put a staircase and then around, of course, you get the building, no? you have an excellent view. Why not like you take it first the architecture and then actually begin to look and to think actually what, what does it create? So you create research or knowledge <laughs> from these things. So like here, no, like thinking of what might be like a corridor, uh, a staircase and so on, more like reverse noise synthesis over like a compositional kind of machine or like a compositional patterning and, and so on. Right? Of course, again, like that's, that's uh, searching shortcuts for students. So these, of course, such models, they, they are more metaphorical in a way but stimulating or open like doors for actually then more, more crucial research. Or also like trying to raise with teaching or with such models of, of, uh, of researching more like then uh, uh, questions what comes next or what, what will be like for your own perspective, your own future, what might be something to work on. <coughs> of course, working on three-dimensional uh, consideration or how you can actually build cities three-dimensional <coughs> is a highly crucial, relevant topic. No? How you create more actually something more dense. So that's then my version. No? Taking modernism, a little bit recombining it, just actually with its own elements. But hey, let's stay more neutral. It would be nice like later to discuss this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I uh, will never forget, in fact, um, 
Ernst and Brigitte decamping for more than a month uh, and uh, working out of uh, New York with uh, Reiner being a kind of frequent guest at that time at uh, Columbia. The Extraction Laboratory, which I'm going to speak a little bit more about, is um, my newest endeavor at um, um, Columbia. It's uh, our um, um, newest uh, uh, research and design uh, laboratory, uh, born out of uh, CHISA, Graduate School of Architecture, Art and Finance, the third year, and directing uh, the Co-1 program there. We'll be looking at a couple of um, um, points that were um, um, of interest. Uh, as a kind of like, not necessarily parallel project to um, practice and making, but one that very much tries to think about making within the context of a place that uh, is extremely compressed. Um, we, I don't think, have uh, uh, more than like uh, three feet, uh, more than a meter of like uh, table space. Uh, so you kind of like by the end of the semester, like share your um, um, jackets, you live in each other's sweat, which uh, kind of very much um, 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 is, is, is kind of like part of the, I think, intensity, but then also attraction of uh, um, New York, that one way or other, uh, that uh, very much like to a certain degree also forces um, collaboration. Um, in the lab, uh, we're looking at a variety of different situations, as, as uh, Maya uh, pointed out, they all look at uh, um, um, thinking through making and making through thinking um, <coughs> situations rather than objects, and it's kind of like uh, um, um, basically an overall um, idea of like architecture and something else. Uh, it's almost like architecture and program, architecture and ecology, architecture and typology, and to a certain degree also like uh, architecture and um, um, ideas. Those different modes um, try to depart from what we do uh, in uh, the grad program uh, itself and run as a kind of like a more intense um, mode of uh, thinking, traveling, and working, which is in parallel to uh, what is our kind of like global approach. The studio access that Columbia runs in like 12 different countries from Mumbai to Rio, um, um, Tokyo, um, Johannesburg, um, Mombasa, as well as uh, a couple of new spaces that are. Uh, of how to open uh, Amman, uh, um, Beirut in Lebanon, and so on and so forth. Um, we are the one lab that allows you to travel in terms of research and looking <coughs> deeper into um, the kind of academic program. Um, we are situated right now um, um, in uh, Morningside Heights, our new um, like campus, uh, with not really um, um, a lab space um, in upstate, but one that uh, very much uh, is next to the new museum, kind of like incubator space uh, we are operating out of. Um, Bika Breibeck, uh, who is not uh, unknown here, close friend of uh, Maya, kind of like uh, started to teach with us, I think, like two years ago, uh, right after I. Um, started to work with uh, Core One, uh, is in charge now of a <coughs> station in the architectural animation uh, unit. But the lab itself um, really looks at and started to look at a variety of different uh, moments. Those are the, the new studios uh, before we uh, started. But in fact, like trying to turn it um, inside out, uh, where we don't necessarily bring like academia into the street, but street um, into academic uh, environments. This is more inside Hyde uh, Park. Uh, the kick off that very much started to look at uh, simple things like how do you deal with gravity um, in uh, uh, a moment where uh, everything computationally um, um, can be almost like predicted. Um, it's a kind of very analog, and I really like showing it's a very, very analog start. Um, we give uh, our uh, groups, it's like 98 people uh, working with us at the moment, um, 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 very, very clear um, directions. Uh, uh, first one, Everything uh, you produce as an archetype has to fit within a 12 by 12 by 12 inch cube, has to weigh at least one pound and uh, create an elegant fall from 40 feet height or sustain uh, um, itself uh, one meter off the ground. So those are um, um, kind of interesting moments of starting to think about uh, not only sight, but also starting to think about how can research actually become something that uh, is uh, applied uh, the one way or other, but uh, at the same time like uh, active, interactive, and conditional. This is a project that uh, we just completed. Uh, those are people that uh, with uh, about 60% certainly do not have a background in architecture, something I'm, uh, I'm still extremely hyped about. Uh, out of 90, uh, um, um, I think seven students, uh, 61, um, come from fields as diverse as uh, astrology, biology, the humanities, like mathematics, uh, um, social sciences, um, um, banking, finance, real estate. There's a lot of like um, um, activism and to a certain degree also like uh, an interesting conversation that is uh, born out of this. Okay, I really need the sound for this. This is virtual other one. Mm -hmm. 
I've been waiting for this all night, actually. <coughs> Is it playing? It's crucial. I hope that you will follow. Oh, right. oh, okay. Something about uh, what kind of the problem that we're dealing with in architecture is that it's rather difficult and sexy. Um, we have programs that kind of like run for like three years uh, that uh, bring uh, an enormous amount of like um, depth and kind of like also cost uh, to the table, but uh, to a certain degree um, um, require a lot in order to get to that moment where uh, building becomes uh, active. So one of the reasons why I wanted. Uh, why I wanted to kind of like think about site and, and, and conditions of ground and, and moments in a, in, a, in a different way when it comes to making is a complete displacement of both tools, accessible um, technologies, uh, and we immersed ourselves in a, um, what uh, was at that point a completely um, um, a non existing environment. This is Black Rock Desert, um, just returned a couple of uh, weeks ago. We set up our uh, laboratory in uh, the Nevada desert. Uh, it's completely empty, there's nothing here. Um, it's uh, the home of uh, the Burning Man Festival, where within like two weeks, 70,000 um, um, people move in. This is like our kind of like Columbia mutant vehicle, where the whole idea is uh, um, um, you thinking about sustainability, access, production, and uh, fabrication in a way you have to do it there, you plan it, but you also have to bring everything out, which is relatively challenging when uh, you can't even drop like half a liter of water uh, unless you make it um, um, disappear. There's different um, um, site conditions and like ecological projects we're um, um, working on it, like it was relatively easy to do because the uh, environment changes uh, about like twice a day uh, um, um, drastically um, from not only sensor works but also like Celsius, but during the day it was like about uh, 50, 55 degrees. Um, the project was uh, eight different domes that were um, um, doing all different things, creating uh, five different uh, temperature zones, um, um, providing a variety of different um, 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 temperature conditions for the project. We closely worked with um, um, Tesla, which is a, um, an electric car um, company. Um, extracting water from uh, the environment uh, through fog catching uh, elements, basically producing what's uh, the most absent in the desert, which in essence is, um, is uh, water. Um, this is one of the people working with us. Um, what was interesting in uh, Burning Man itself is that like, uh, um, the, the idea of uh, making was of course not left behind. It had something to do with uh, prefabrication um, 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 at that uh, particular moment, bringing things to not only containers but shipping um, um, situations uh, to, to, to the desert and kind of like install it but then also in situ um, rework it. Um, we were uh, semi-protected. Uh, the lab uh, set itself up. I mean, this is probably the worst drawing uh, you could possibly find of uh, RVs, uh, automobile, um, the four of them kind of like providing just enough of, of uh, a kind of like backdrop for us to uh, work for uh, a series of weeks. Um, the whole seminar started, or the whole project uh, um, decamped from Manhattan uh, July 20th, uh, relocated to Las Vegas, where we revisited um, ideas of uh, event cities, uh, um, looking at also uh, somebody else uh, uh, I closely and intensely research on uh, that particular topic at uh, Columbia, um, Bernard Chumi, and kind of like started to think about well, not only what can you learn from Vegas, but also what is uh, um, um, a condition of uh, a variety of different site modifications, um, events, and uh, moments of uh, um, ideologies that bring to the table. This is a quick trailer uh, that, uh, that kind of tries to not only highlight what has happened here, but also like uh, what uh, an environment that doesn't exist uh, start to become once you uh, implement uh, architecture. Of course, the term architecture here is fresh because uh, a lot of people come, uh, come in come in with a particular ambition, and the ambition being uh, um, um, to contribute. Uh, contributing uh, what you invest, uh, oftentimes music, oftentimes uh, um, food, oftentimes architecture, oftentimes structural advice, you know, the repair bodies, um, set up your hand um, in that uh, uh, regard. Um, there's a lot of uh, focus on uh, installation, installation art, and then making art not all of you good, but still uh, kind of like it's driven and interesting. Um, it was one of the probably first moments Where, um, it was one of the first moments 
Maya, and thanks uh, everyone involved in organizing this event. I'm very happy uh, to be here. Um, I graduated in architecture in 2007 with uh, a project on the art in Paris. Um, I was studying architecture, uh, but not only at SAS uh, and Patrick's studio, but I actually started out at Hans Holland's studio. And because this event tonight is um, organized around uh, research and teaching, uh, I can't stress enough how much uh, influence um, these three studio systems had on me. And um, the starting point uh, for me becoming an academic was um, after the first semester because um, Hans Online Studio had this uh, project where they would um, <coughs> give each first year uh, the Autumnplatz um, project. And this was running uh, 10 years uh, when I started uh, studying architecture, so all the good places were already gone. Um, and <laughs> so we had to our group of, of first years had to um, come up with uh, new ideas of how to analyze uh, cities and uh, architecture. And I, in the end, uh, chose a uh, painting by Pablo Picasso on Ile de la Cité um, in Paris. So I began with Paris and ended with Paris. Um, and um, this was after the semester. It was like really the moment where I thought, I really like doing research. Um, then uh, Holain um, um, uh, left the Angewandte and along came uh, Greg Lynn, which uh, was another teaching moment for me because uh, I had to change my architectural mindset and leave my comfort zone. And uh, this was a starting point of uh, me thinking about media and how uh, different um, software and visualiz visualization techniques have an impact on our architectural thinking. So uh, then I switched to uh, Sarah's and Patrick's studio and what I really liked there was this one month of uh, each year where we had, we had this uh, one year project and this one month was dedicated for research. So we had reading lists and discussions on all kinds of different uh, theories, not necessarily um, uh, situated in architecture, all kinds of um, topics on complexity and, and so on. So by the time um, I did my diploma project, I already knew what I wanted to do afterwards, and this was a PhD. Um, and so uh, one month uh, out of architecture school, um, I started putting together my uh, PhD proposal for cultural studies, uh, which happened to uh, which I happened to do here at the Angewandte too, because uh, back then the Gabriele Werner was the art history um, uh, professor, and she is one um, of three editors uh, who founded the Bildwelt in des Wissens magazine uh, together with uh, Horst Bellekamp, um, and which is situated around. Um, different kinds of uh, images and visualizations, not necessarily rooted in art, but um, expanded on uh, science and technology. So I did a PhD in cultural studies, mainly in art history and history, history and theory of architecture. And I was lucky enough to get a scholarship from the Austrian Academy of Sciences, <laughs> which allowed me to do uh, three years of um, sitting at this desk, reading a lot of stuff uh, and writing um, um, my thesis. Um, by the time I um, got about the uh, PhD thesis, it was in 2010, um, I got a, a postdoctoral post uh, fellowship at the IKKM, which is roughly translated as an Institute for Advanced Study on Cultural Techniques and Media Philosophy, right at the very heart of the Bauhaus movement in Weimar, Germany. And there was a, a research fellow, and um, the IKKM is very much uh, an institution similar to uh, other institutes uh, for advanced studies uh, around the world, where you have a semester topic and different uh, scholars and academics uh, from various fields. So um, usually um, they were mostly from social studies, um, uh, philosophy, um, literature studies, um, uh, media studies, um, and yeah, there was this one uh, program uh, called Tools of Design where they gathered um, different uh, postdocs for research on 
how to of um, design matter in not only in, in architecture uh, and in art, but also in the sciences and technology. So um, I was there for three years as a research fellow and um, then got um, another position at MEX, uh, which is another institute for advanced uh, study. Ooh, yeah, typo. Uh, advanced study on media cultures of computer simulation at Lafana University in Lüneburg. Uh, Lüneburg is uh, part of the metropolitan area uh, of Hamburg. And this is to uh, institute um, mainly um, run and organized uh, for um, researchers and scholars from the humanities. And um, the main issue is how uh, is um, Today's knowledge uh, changed by the uh, is today's um, um, knowledge generation um, modified by computer simulations. Um, I'm usually uh, the only one from uh, architecture, um, but um, what this work constitutes is um, doing research projects and presenting and discussing work with many scholars from various disciplines, which forced me because. Um, mostly there were no other architects, to be very precise um, in uh, explaining how architecture uses different technologies and methodologies when it comes to um, design um, and aesthetics and um, um, generation of knowledge. So, um, it was also great because um, this was a mixed group of um, apart from media studies, um, physics, um, biology, science studies, and media studies. And we had um, also a trip in a collaboration with a physicist from uh, CERN, uh, which was uh, a great opportunity, uh, but also um, interviewing um, influential people like Adam Sutherland, the father and founder of uh, Sketchpad, uh, one of uh, the first software um, on computer graphics. And, but what my actual research uh, is about is um, writing books on uh, history and theory of uh, architecture and uh, one book project is entitled uh, Visual Constructions, Architectural Images in Digital Media Cultures and the other one, Design Process, Software Computation, Cultural Techniques in Architecture. So what my work um, constitutes of is of course, sitting uh, in front of my laptop, um, reading a lot of books, but also researching archival uh, material, such as uh, at the um, CCA in uh, Montreal. So researching digital archival material, because my research focus is on um, contemporary architecture or uh, on architecture right um, after the first digital turn, so um, early 1990s, but also analyzing competitions. Visiting and analyzing pavilions such as uh, SOMAS, uh, White Noise, um, visiting and analyzing some more pavilions such as uh, the last research pavilion um, at uh, the University of Stuttgart at ICD and ETK, um, interviewing architects and engineers at Bollinger's, for instance, um, interviewing some more architects and engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, but also what was great at, um, um, at MEX, at uh, Lafan University in Lüneburg, is that I had the opportunity to organize and to bring uh, together people from my discipline, which is architecture, with other disciplines. Because um, some parts of the humanities are thinking about uh, issues which also um, are, of course, um, um, very uh, crucial for uh, architecture. So, um, the first symposium I organized um, was in 2015, entitled Computation Design Culture, Scripting, Scripting Simulation and the Making of Architecture, and there are some familiar names, so Matthias was there, um, but also uh, other people from uh, Die Angewandte, and um, this was a great first uh, test run to see how uh, these different cultures will click together uh, when it comes uh, to discussing questions um, in regards of what uh, computational um, design does um, for architecture and um, for aesthetics and um, uh, generation of knowledge. So just a few pictures. And the second one um, I organized this year uh, had a more broader approach uh, where it um, 
Also, um, so on the first hand, um, again, architects and people from um, history and view of architecture, but also uh, philosophy, uh, film and game studies. And it was to bring them together for a discussion on, okay, what, how can we um, discuss a, a, a basic uh, principles such as perspective? From, from the um, optical and geometrical um, uh, perspect, um, position, but also uh, in regards of how um, do these new technologies change uh, our perception and our strategies um, in design. And um, so my research was mainly on uh, these two uh, poles, which is media and mediums, and media um, like movies, TV uh, shows, and games, and the other one, mediums, which is everything um, like uh, drawing, diagram, rendering, photo model, script, simulation, but also, of course, uh, a building. And what really um, drives my, my interest in research is um, the aesthetic and the epistemic. So the aesthetic, um, not only how something looks, but how and in which manner do we perceive something. And the epistemic, how and in which manner do we know something. So how does computation and simulation change the ways um, we uh, generate shapes, forms, and uh, of course knowledge. And um, the, my main strategy is um, to, to make this uh, a three part for uh, architectural media and theory. And I'm um, mainly interested in architectural media theory that addresses both um, the design of digital environments as well as architecture experienced on screen. And um, what I mean by that is that um, since I'm now at, in the uh, humanities, and I'm teaching not only um, students from architecture, but uh, mainly um, students uh, from cultural studies and media studies. And it's always uh, a challenge to bring these two disciplines together uh, for common ground. There is common ground, there's much common ground, but other disciplines have different vocabulary, different um, um, meanings of, of um, theories, and so the one methodology I always used in the past couple of years when I was uh, teaching a seminar is um, in the first two uh, sessions to familiarize students from architecture as well as uh, from uh, cultural studies with different uh, concepts and theories and um, architectural design. And uh, this only... Um, works very well when I show uh, clips uh, from movies and TV shows and um, computer games. So um, this also forces me, of course, to look in this different uh, media and to search for uh, particular examples when we do an assigned uh, reading on a, <laughs> uh, a theoretical text. Um, what could uh, fit together? And there's a lot of material um, in contemporary cinema and, of course, um, TV, um, but also um, uh, video games. So, um, last year I did a, a seminar on uh, scenes of architecture, where I would uh, teach together with a colleague from film studies, um, these uh, students from uh, cultural studies, how to analyze and to uh, discuss architecture via um, scenes uh, in movies, TV shows, and uh, games. And this uh, led to uh, the launch of uh, a website where I would uh, publish um, all this uh, teaching material um, uh, collected uh, in the past um, several years. And, uh, less than uh, 24 hours ago, I finally uh, posted the first uh, entry, which is called Drawing Lines, um, Ariadne Designs Labyrinth uh, in Inception, because um, how to better start something new in architecture, let's take the labyrinth, the um motif um, of architecture, um, and so this led to uh, a new project and it's a, a new strategy um, to not only um, publish academic papers and, and books but also to broaden the discussion and uh, to invite other people um, for a discussion on architecture and education and research. Thank you.
thank you all so much, first of all, for uh, answering to the call uh, and uh, taking the time to come and to be here. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, I think a lot of a lot of interesting stuff came out of uh, your presentation, but maybe I still want to start maybe from a personal point of view uh, for all of you being students here. I mean, not going too far back, I'm just interested in, because all of you studied with people with very strong positions, right? Back then in the, I don't know whether it was late 90, you know, early or late 90s, and uh, I'm, interesting, uh, I'm interested if that's something that was inspiring and, you know, if you had to, at a certain point, kill your fathers to move on, or even if nowadays having a position is important. So maybe, I don't know, Nicole, Nicole started with saying, I think that was, that, that was interesting that you did not that you kind of went through a few different pedagogies, right, from Holland to Breck, uh, and then finished actually with Zaha, so you actually got all of it, right? And I mean, I know you long enough to know that. I don't know if all, I mean, I, Moritz, you went through Aachen, mm -hmm. right? And then kind of ended up here and finished here, yep. right? Uh, were you, what about Christoph? Were, did you did your whole time with, uh, with, with, with Wolf? No, for, um, I actually was, I don't know if you still remember Bart Lotzma. Um, yeah. Bart was very, very uh, important at that time. Uh, um, he uh, invited uh, a few of us to participate in, in uh, the Berlache, uh, as it still existed. So I, I did a stint at the Berlache. Then I uh, went to the Cooper Union Ernst Chinese School of Architecture for uh, what at that time was a non-matriculated um, um, exchange program. Um, have not quite returned to the Angewandte because just as with uh, Matthias, the uh, Max Center and like, their architects and uh, art artists uh, in residence program was kind of a very important uh, moment. And uh, through that detour of Los Angeles that then um, 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 took two and a half years mm -hmm. because uh, um, um, Co-op Himmelblau's uh, High School of Visual Performing Arts, uh, HS9, um, was under construction or was about to be under construction, which I was lucky to uh, be part of. But to answer your question, I don't necessarily think it's 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 just about the the, the kind of the networks that that fall into your lap or an education that you kind of um, um, put uh, together. But it's one that you kind of like curate for yourself. I. Um, um, I, what we were exposed to was, was kind of like one studio for, uh, at that time, five years, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the kind of system was a very, very different one. Whereas in the United States and like many different places, you kind of like, you really change your position every, as you all know, every uh, uh, semester. So throughout like a graduate program, uh, MRC1, MRC2, and then there's many, many others like, you know, CCP, in our case, conceptual curatorial practices, which Pika was part of. Uh, uh, um, like you every semester deal with uh, a variety of different like positions whereas also the students and people that research uh, and like that's the same uh, I mean in, in all of our like places like come with uh, very particular positions history is a very interesting I loved your like talking kind of unraveling in that context it's a very interesting question because it's obviously not just like one history um, but that's Martin, because that's a that's not an undergraduate program right um, it's a graduate program, but it's not so different in like undergrad um, um, studies in that like if you look at it in a more global sense where, you know, you, you, you don't just like, I think, take one position and like uh, in, in the case of history, you don't just like look at one history, but like first of all, multiple histories, but then also, you know, if uh, um, um, a very, very global conversation about like um, um, not necessarily faculty research, but student uh, uh, research comes to the table, you start to look at um, not only different cultural contexts, but also different cultures, plural. Um, so I'm not so sure if, if uh, um, yes, there were very strong personalities. Uh, you find them uh, everywhere, but like uh, we were very, very mobile. And like I, some of the, the people uh, that, that you brought together and like um, um, all of the the kind of like the posters and like symposiums like uh, also Matthias is working on is like the multiplicity of I think like use and like ideas and contexts that, that kind of like 
make it also very interesting as a as a kind of like research mm -hmm. ground, right? Like where the academy and practice and like practicing and, 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 and the way we are all like working and, and, mm -hmm. and building whatever that is at the end yeah. of the day changes. But then Matthias, for example, you mentioned that you kind of enjoy this one year with a thesis student, if I got it yes. right. And that that, I don't know if that's a matter of a time frame, but it seems that that time frame kind of, you know, being with somebody longer than maybe a semester or a trimester, mm -hmm. it depends on how the schools are organized all over the place, to, to develop a certain rigor yeah. in the work, right? I mean, there's one thing I would like to add to your first question, I yeah. think it's relevant. I'm probably the most local guy from this round here because actually my gymnasium was around the corner. <laughs> so actually I, I went to high school here. Yeah. And I dropped actually, actually into the school during my high school time. I was already looking what are they doing, how are they doing, things okay. and so on. And the first, the first time I came to the studio, the yeah. first hour, the yeah. first meeting with Hans Holland, Hans Holland sits down and the first thing he says is, architecture is an autodidactic study. Yeah. So this was actually the plan from Hans Horan. It's okay. not about him imposing any form of right. teaching on you. He rather was like, let's see what they're going to do. Right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, I have to admit that I learned a lot about Hans Horan rather reading about his stuff from the 60s and observing what they were doing back then. And they were doing magazines, they were doing exhibitions, they went to teaching. No one ever at the Angola told me, hmm, you could actually go into teaching. It could be interesting. Or, you know, you could do this or that. It was a very strange time, by the mm -hmm. way, I have to say. Yeah, like, for example, I, own, I knew about the Paper Studio mm -hmm. in Colombia, but no one ever, ever told me in this school, how about you do an exchange thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. it didn't happen. Right. Yeah? So I think this kind of autodidactic thing was very strong. Mm -hmm. yeah? And the other thing is, uh, for your second question, yes, I think you need a specific amount of time to prepare somebody, to prepare, like really go for a rigorous approach in a project. Mm -hmm. Daniel, how, what, what, what's your experience of that? Because it's, I'm following up on the discussion, yeah. I don't know if, you, if any of us uh, saw that, in the previous session where we had like two oppositions in terms of being a student shopper in a certain way, mm -hmm. like, right. you know, which is, which, which is so, you know, without judgment or actually having that a certain consistency. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, the strong personality question, huh? I mean, I completely enjoyed it, actually, that the, the studio was about one topic. Mm -hmm. Simply because, like, okay, when from the outside, like, always you got these questions, yeah, okay, yeah, I know, I know, like, you're the drawing one. Huh? Right. Yeah, anyhow, you're producing, you're just repeating this, what, anyhow, what, what should be delivered, it's like a con continuous, coherent uh, agenda, and you just contribute to this. But actually, it freed you off from a lot of other things. You didn't have to develop, at first place, your own vocabulary, your own techniques and so on, but you could then think about an idea. You could, you could learn like basic stuff, how you begin to design in a way. And that's, and, yeah, and of course, like, what then also, what I think is crucial is, you need more time than just a semester and just a year, actually, to, to grow or like to, to understand certain issues. And I think, from my own experience now, it's uh, I see it at the moment is you, you run exactly in, the, in a different uh, topic with the studio system that actually I think it's more even dangerous when you change every semester because what you then see is just about style. It's just that you see uh, students which are begin to raise in the beginning of the semester, like the, the, the questions would be, okay, what should I deliver? And then it would be nice that simply like this question is often, it's about, hey, it's about that you begin to learn or like to, to uh, engage with something which might be architecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I see maybe, maybe, maybe if we talk about the kind of education and research complex, right, the, the way how those two work, work together, it seems in a certain way that the spirit of exploration allows you to to really, um, you know, question the, 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 whether the, the established regimes of something, but also um, it gives you the possibility to, to um, I don't know, to re, you know, to do stuff which the, which, the, which the reality out there might not be ready to support. Do you know where, 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 where I'm going with that? I'm trying to figure out if, if, if kind of, Research with academia is kind of a way to get like 
um, uh, like really uh, challenging pro uh, project out, projects out. Not necessarily in terms of, uh, of, a, of a building, or probably not in, in form of a building, but to really test the, test, test the ideas on an on a almost real scale. I mean, there is a danger, I think, to that, to that idea, yeah, because uh, uh, I think sometimes students confuse doing a pavilion with doing architecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there is like a lot of problems involved in that that we have not solved yet in our discipline. But that's the challenge. I think that's a beautiful challenge. That's actually one of the reasons why I'm doing that is because I want to find out how can we translate that into a, you know, into an architectural project that we can really, you know, manifest mm -hmm. properly. Yeah, Christoph taught something nice, no? when he said like, uh, actually making in 1D is actually creating ideas mm -hmm. of architecture. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's, yeah, that's, uh, of course you start with an idea, no, one dimension, and I think today you, you with the pavilion, you have more the instrument on such scales to, to weave, like, you know, really weaving literally like many, many ideas. No? That's also uh, a way of, of, of teaching, communicating, and researching. Uh, Sure, and this, uh, the, the research that is done, let's say, for example, in Stuttgart, right? I mean, these this amazing pavilions you guys publish every year or twice a year. I mean, it's an uh, amazing output if you, if, if you look at that. Um, what's the landscape German research is embedded with? You know, who is, is that? Is that also the way how schools stay relevant? Is that the bridge between schools and, I don't know, the industry? whatever that, that wants to be? I think um, that we have this duality in our work. In the one hand, like addressing really um, hands-on problems in building construction, but on the other hand, having this design exploration coupled to that mm -hmm. helps a lot to anchor it in a research environment. Mm -hmm. So um, there's just a lot of funding from building industry that can be attracted by uh, arguing the hard facts, but on the other hand, uh, also delivering uh, um, the, the, the instrument that communicates that idea. Yeah? So um, I just now I see the, for example, the, the, the um, now that I'm going to Munich quite a bit uh, and see the discussions there. Um, it, it's in the research perspective actually amazing how architecture is embedded as one of those central parts in the university in Stuttgart. Uh, it's also by the president of the university here. He sees that as one most crucial thing uh, uh, in the university. While in a lot of universities, architecture is still like a cost factor on the payroll. Okay, we educate we educate architects, but no one even knows that there's research in architecture. You know, so uh, and but on the other hand, it's then because that all goes to the building engineers or something. Yeah? So it's important to keep that at the architects to also uh, like develop that as a design tool and not only as a technical. Sure. And I think the, um, the pavilions as a vehicle are, are really um, are a really great instrument uh, because it's, it, it's not architecture per se, that's what I say, you, you cut a lot of things away and focus on one point, um, uh, but it really allows you to push, to push certain things. To not only put a technology out there, but also the design methodology, uh, but we, all, like, we, see a lot of, um, we see a lot of pavilions which are Pavilions for being a pavilion, I, I, I think. It's a lot of, also like then speaking more from a technical point of view, you see a lot of things where you say, okay, if that would be one meter larger, it would collapse, you know? Right. What we say is, all, what we show is really also has a certain rigor in the scientific um, uh, uh, approach, yeah? It's showcasing a technology that is always able to be upscaled, yeah? It's always something that could be larger. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also important, and I think that distinguishes it a little bit from other. And it's also this ecology, which you mentioned before. So it's um, like what uh, Jan and Achim put together there, the interdisciplinarity in the program, mm -hmm. uh, the, the connection with uh, um, other research institutes within the university, industry funding. I think that's a, that's a great platform. Yeah? And also continuity, like uh, talking about the length of a program, how long do you stay there? Um, the good thing is that students can pick something up and then add, add their part to it, yeah? Like, uh, you do, as, as, as Daniel said, you don't need to reinvent uh, mm -hmm. completely from bottom up, but you have interesting trajectories. You give them your specific direction, your specific input, but uh, you, you can build up on something in a two years program. Yeah. Nicole, you worked for quite a while in, in the German landscape as well, right? I'm just interesting, uh, interested if because the work, for example, done, done in Stuttgart is very, you know, they are, they are 
from the engineering point of view, you know, this stuff is like it's you know it's science fiction probably, you know, but it's also super it's, it's very um, easy to un I think not not easy to understand, but very uh, uh, it has it has uh, like a like a not to understand me wrong. It has a quantitative, you know, um, um, way how you could evaluate it and the one you could sell it in order to get funding, right? How is it with with uh, more, um, you know, uh, design driven or or from 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 the from the humanities? Like really, from that point of view, is that accepted in the same way? Before, I, before, before I answer that, I want to come back to your very first uh, question on um, how these strong positions of uh, all our professors shaped um, our education. Um, and also what they had in common is, I think, um, the idea that architecture has a cultural agenda. It's not just technology, it's not just building, it ha has cultural level. Mm -hmm. And um, because of, of this cultural impact, this is one side, not the reason why I went into cultural studies, um, but um, for the past seven years, I mean, uh, I'm based in Germany, I'm in, at research institutions, and um, the German funding system for basic research um, is incredible because they don't only have the, the state-funded um, institutions, but also um, additional um, funding tools. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, humanities uh, is still a very high-valued um, um, product, so to speak, um, as the intellectual discussion is still a very part of the day-to-day -day life of uh, um, many people. Mm -hmm. So you have the feuilletons and, and so on. So there is a, 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 I would say, a bigger interest into humanities. Um, or Germany is a very good place for that. Um, when it comes to design research, um, it becomes muddy. Mm -hmm. um, because um, what I experienced is that um, people usually, as you said, um, they are not seeing that architecture don't do only buildings or design buildings but also can do research and um, there is this kind of romantic notion of what an architecture does or what, what architecture can do so you can as a, in speaking of the German landscape just look um, how um, bashing architects and bashing architecture is very popular and I also have to say that um, what was great here at the Angewandt and with all these professors is that Architecture is something very special, very unique, and you're, you're some kind of empowered by that notion. And um, imagine my um, amazement and disappointment when I learned that no one outside of architecture is interested in architecture. <laughs> I was I was baffled, and it's kind of my, the intention to to um, not only um, bring uh, back a discussion on our, our history and theory in architecture, but also to talk to other people, to researchers, to the general public, what can architecture do? And this is, um, yeah, a cultural agenda. And and it's interesting, why is that so? That, that the discourse, what do you guys think, that the discourse is so? It's education and also because of the uh, change of media and technology. If you talk, if I, when I talk to um, architectural historians and I'm talking about um, the architecture uh, from the early 1990s, they say, ah yeah, it's computer design. So it's totally put aside, but I mean, it's now over 20 years old, so it's part of, of architectural history. Mm -hmm. And it changed mm -hmm. the demands of um, what architect, uh, what theory and um, history can do. And because almost there are so many few people working in this uh, area, there is not really much of a discourse when it comes to um, um, the humanities, so yeah. That's my my guess. Yeah.
I think that, that discourse is basically, I think it's completely shifting at the moment. Yeah. Right? I mean, we're experiencing really like the moment where this first wave of computational design and fascination mm -hmm. is actually really over, mm -hmm. and it become like a total standard. Every architect in the world uses computers. Mm -hmm. Digital architecture as a title has no value at all anymore. Mm -hmm. So actually, you really have to start discussing the cultural implications, that, you know, what kind of responses to, to generate in audiences to for architecture. And you know they they really more more profound disciplinary questions and not the technical questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But of course, like, especially the cultural question or the cultural scale, like race is, I think, also the next phase or where they see a dissatisfaction. I mean, it's the it's the question of the scalability. You know, you mentioned like, hey, no one is interested in these experiments outside, mm -hmm. and this is this has of course has dramatically to change. So I mean, if you went now to a phase where you set up like certain instruments, and I was like, 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 okay, how you actually, with a kind of making, with a kind of like design, actually begin to think, you know, mm -hmm. like being conscious about this. Okay, it's longer than, than just this digit, but because like you could not directly build it and apply it, of course, like it was a niche to think, you know, to think or especially constrain research in that or thinking what what could be research. But there's a thing that very much the next phase that we we have to make it. Be capable, no? So how you now actually the, no, the research demonstrator, the the pavilion, or like this medium, how you make that actually scalable? That means not only not in, in physical scale, but in something something beyond, like that it gets interdisciplinary. No? Like how you right. actually connect these. Would the dis yeah. interdisciplinarity, like you know, like in Christoph's lab, where he says, you know, yeah. you know, he brings together different kind of people, like Nicole's work, which goes like uh, over uh, again different kind of disciplines. You know, is, is is that a way to kind of let people in? Well, there is a, I, what what I find really interesting, and just like echoing some of the things that were discussed already, like that there is. It's, it's not so clear anymore, first of all, what I think architecture is, sure. right? Like, I mean, I, I, it, it also is an, an incredible, like, liberty and liberalism we are dealing with, you know? It's okay to kind of, uh, you know, do tattoos for a living or to, to kind of, like, uh, open a bar or to, you know, like, do buildings or material research or, like, go into into uh, a make. It's okay, right? Like, there's so many different modes of practice, whereas, um, um, it, it, I'm not so sure if this is what, what uh, I think was echoed uh, in the past, where mm -hmm. it was very, very clear what at least it was imagined uh, uh, what you have to do as an architect, what you do when you do architecture, um, um, and what you do when you don't do it, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of things when it comes to practice also have to do with, I mean, I, I really enjoyed like hearing uh, what you said because I always feel like, I mean, in New York, like uh, I, 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 I was trying to figure out like who was the last person who was really interested that I'm an architect and it was uh, 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 Stephen Lim, my dentist, you know, like you're lying there and it's like I actually really wanted to become an architect and it's the same in, I, I don't know if you experience this in Los Angeles too, I, there's something beautiful about that too, you're kind of left alone, right, in LA everybody wants to be an actor or in theater or like you want to be an actor advertisement um, and in New York it's kind of its own uh, ball game so it's kind of like nice to have that liberty of like you know like thinking about architecture and kind of like cultural movements in, in very particular ways it, it, it's like you know interdisciplinarity doesn't always mean like many different people from different in, in, in disciplines it sometimes means like like doing like one thing in multiple ways really great and one example is like I don't know if it's still here but like I um, last time I came to Vienna was uh, uh, right when BU was uh, under construction and you know like of course was very excited to see all the projects and um, um, at the time I was like exhausted to death like I sit down and like the most kind of like beautiful um, um, like project uh, within all this kind of like you know kind of like modes of making and architecture was like uh, a series of like uh, benches or like matrixes uh, Rupert Simon like designed. Uh, it was like like quite powerful as a as a as a kind of like now embarrassed you, but like as a as a as a, as a mode of like you know thinking of architecture is is kind of like you know not necessarily like an, an urban extension, but a kind of like body extension. And like it's a small project and like deals with material and structure in a different way. But like it's, it, I, I don't think it's so clear that like a building is a building is a building rather than like you know the, the kind of exploration of such. Especially probably Moritz, right? I mean, you write digital protocols, right? I mean, or a lot of, a lot, I guess, a big part of your work, even at Fiber, right, is 
not producing drawings, not producing like very traditional architectural material, right, that a architect should be doing. Yeah, so it's, um, it's also challenging a little bit this traditional separation between there's an architect, there's an engineer, and there's a mm -hmm. company that just executes what, what, whatever comes out at, at the end of this linear process. Yeah? Uh, but, yeah, but interestingly, although the um, building industry is often too conservative to put these innovations on themselves, mm -hmm. like existing companies, uh, um, f uh, there's a lot of uh, interest what we're doing in a way that they integrate us early on. They say, okay, of course this is driven by the material and the process that you have, and we have actually no clue about it. We just see that it's really cool for what we want to do, and we get integrated into the design process uh, uh, very early on. That's actually also also challenging the role of the architect, as you said, the architects can do it all kind of things, so now I, I'm as an architect doing a, doing a mm -hmm. building industry job, more or less, yeah, but with a very strong design input in all of the projects as well, yeah? Right, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, that's also like this, this, the stereotypical thinking about actually what architects do is incredible. I mean, actually, they, they still think we have like these drawing boards and then like, you know, this, movie, yeah. I mean, in every Super movie, nice yeah, apartments, yeah. Very nice yeah. person yeah. on the chairs. This is incredible. Glass. And but the, 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 because you mentioned that it, it's so funny actually that in our practice, actually, we, the only plans that we actually do, yeah, are for authorities and things like that. We never do this for, for ourselves mm -hmm. in the studio because mm -hmm. there's no necessity to do them. So this conversation is open, so if anybody has something to click with, I have one more question which I actually want to put in there, but you know, if anybody wants to add something to it, just just shout, right? Or if you have a specific question, just just shout, and, and, and you're in. So, but do you think that that change is, uh, in a super broad sense, it's all a consequence of the technological change or or that we were experienced in the last I don't know 20 years it has a huge part I mean I think there were a lot of ideas developed um, a long time ago but I, I think we now just have the tools to implement lots of that yeah because I think that also Christoph writes in his uh, description about the lab that you're not writing the technological hype right but you are using the latest technologies in order to, to, to produce that. It seems like, I don't know, what's the, what's the, air, what's the air at Columbia in terms of students, from the student side about, about technology? Also in terms of education, I think a lot of programs get towards, you know, to, to tailor you towards the profession on a very technological level. Um, like, it's, it, it's extremely diverse in terms of approach. Um, and what that means is uh, we, very much take advantage of uh, where we are physically. Uh, it's easy for, I think, a Columbia student to be extremely local within like a global context, where every possible fabricator that you could like dream of working together is like a kind of two dollar fifty subway right uh, away. So our kind of like fabrication shop and like uh, um, in engagement is kind of like expanded, uh, not only throughout the city but a variety of different kind of. Um, not necessarily just collaborations, but attempts uh, of, of, of collaboration. So technology and like is obviously a, a kind of part of the conversation. I think it becomes a bit more difficult if, if, if one would say it's a driving force. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other questions I think that are interesting, uh, and just to name one uh, within the context of technology, and you brought that up in I think like a, a very like elegant way, which is also the notion of accessibility, right? Like I, like I, it, 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 the conversation shifts if we kind of like move like geographically to uh, places where uh, your kind of like average weekly income is like $15 or like 12 euros. So it's kind of like, like access to what we broadly define and to some degree also limit as what architecture is, like changes as the kind of like uh, both culture and geography of it uh, um, um, changes. And I mean, there are a couple of interesting ways of actually bringing the two things together. I quite like the Serpentine uh, uh, Pavilion um, 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 this year, where really like uh, a, a mode of thinking and working was translated into a, a, a kind of different kind of uh, um, uh, materiality. But then there's also things of like, you know, questions of, 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 of uh, um, um, accessibility in terms of like education and like architecture. And I, um, I you know, um, how should I put this? I, if an, an architecture degree these days is like about, like, you 
I don't know, maybe you can help me, like $150,000, $170,000, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, so that's kind of like, uh, you do a lot of, like, um, like, work in order to kind of, like, recuperate from that. So I, I, I think it's very important to keep this in mind to a certain degree when we speak about like cultural context and like technology because like technology like is 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 is, is a language just as like the reality of like a uh, um, multiplicity of like languages that are spoken simultaneously in, 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 in the making of it, which is like really something I'm like really interested in in, in tonight's conversation more so than like our architecture as a kind of like pedagogy. I mean, the, the, the one thing which I would say is that, first of all, this is not the first time that happened. I mean, in, uh, in architectural history, yeah, we have right. always these kind of things that actually trigger an architectural movement. Mm -hmm. Let's say the invention of reinforced concrete, mm -hmm. making modernity possible, we know, we know it. So this is not really uh, uh, exceptional, but uh, what I see is right now is, is the changing landscape in that mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, embracing this sort of technology. So what I see, for example, as example in our universities, and these cases have happened where students graduate, and after graduation, they buy a second-hand robot for $2,000 and set up shop in Detroit to start producing mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. So I think this is, like an ex uh, this is not an example now of somebody making an architecture office out of it, right. but rather understanding that the, the tools that you learn uh, yeah. in, in, uh, you know, in, enables other things. Having even a completely different point of view on this, I think that this what, what the architectural knowledge is, is actually quite steadily the same, but we wake up now at the moment actually from our own cliché what actually it can be delivered. No? So, so actually you see now that actually through this whole objectification, food digitalization, like since 60s so optimization, no? really more and more everything is a product. So we see then of course like composition issues, that what classical, what, what actually architecture does, it's like a more and more relevant in all different fields. No? It's like I mean you talk about well, software architecture and so on and so on. No? So actually, there's something very crucial there, but but we wake up wake up that actually we're surprised even that this body of knowledge gets actually crucial for for other fields mm -hmm. and so on. So there's something actually quite quite nice that you see architecture. It's not like we had like in, in Pomo, like everyone was curious, everyone was afraid that architecture would disappear. You know, it gets the facade. It's more and more like just I know and 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 now it's actually. It's a way back again, <laughs> but but of course in, in such a range and diversity, which yeah, it's not before. Any pressing questions from the audience? Everybody thirsty? Thirsty, hungry, yes. thirsty. So good. <laughs> I would close it here. I hope maybe that even we open up some things that people, you know, people from the audience are going to run over to you at the bar and just, you know, maybe, maybe want to know something more about it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.